If you've wondered what the bottom of the barrel looks like, it's this. This is what the bottom looks like. There is no lower. It's a tired story at this point that GPUs are hard to come by, but today we're reviewing the Dell G5 5000 GTX 1660 Super. And uh, this came in the system we just reviewed. The video card doesn't look like much. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now and we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So today we're gonna look at the gaming performance, the thermals, and some of the other characteristics of this video card. But one of the things we wanna do is disassemble it because this is a very plain looking PCB. The shroud itself is not branded at all. This is normally you would see a, a board partner card. So that'd be something like EVGA, ASUS, MSI, so forth in a system integrator system, this comes from an OEM. And so what they're doing is the cheapest possible route. And that is to source everything from other suppliers without branding on it and uh, basically make a, a quote unquote Dell video card. But it's really just a Dell VBIOS on you know a PCB with a cheap cooler. So we've already done all the testing on this at this point. Everything's been completed, which means that the teardown we're doing right now will not affect those results. And we'll look at the results after showing the teardown in terms of the of the video. We're going to use one of the GN teardown toolkits and we'll also be using our mod mat which is available on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up one of these mod mats. This is the large volt uh, anti-static PC building a work surface. Okay so uh, let's look at this externally first. First of all I should probably get another this is a not too expensive 1660 Super so it's similar and this is an EVGA model. So this is an EVGA 1660 Super. You see a difference in the PCB size, but in terms of what's on here, it's the same core component. So they both have a GPU on the other side of the PCB. They both have the same amount of memory modules. There's two blanks on each of these because the board can be repurposed for another video card with a uh, different memory capacity. And then in terms of the cooling solutions, Dell's gone with a single axial fan on top of a cheap aluminum heatsink. And you can already see by looking in here that there's no contact at all between the heatsink and the memory modules. So that's something we noted in the Dell G5 5000 system review. What we're able to do with this individual video card review is look at, if you're really willing to throw everything else away, is it worth buying the system for just the video card? Is the video card any good on its own? So uh, one of the things we'll look at is pressure testing, just because with only four screws, and with screws that are in particular this weekly secured, the pressure is, is not going to be phenomenal. So I'll take those out. That's it for screws. There's one more back here in the I.O. There's two holding the I.O. plate to the PCB, but we don't need to take those out to take this apart. So the cooler should look pretty familiar to anyone who's ever seen an Intel stock cooler. OK, so now we can show you what the PCB and the cooler looks like. So this cooler, we've done some digging through materials we have to, to understand the cost of this thing. The actual cost for Dell to purchase this, this heatsink fan assembly is what they're normally called. Uh, so that would include the shroud, plastic shroud, the aluminum only, there's zero copper. There's no copper heat pipes, there's no copper cold plate. Uh, it, there's no vapor chamber, obviously. It's just an aluminum sink, plus the fan. This cost is under $10 for sure for this entire thing. So that, that's what you're getting. That's the quality you're getting with the 1660 Super. In other words, if you're buying, the, if you're buying a pre-built just for the video card, we would advise almost any other pre-built than the Dell one because at least with an SI system, you'll get a card that maybe has a good cooler uh, or at least a VBIOS that's going to be more universally tested by the manufacturer. So anyway, that's the starting point. Okay, here you go. Here's some familiar coolers. So this has actually got a copper slug in it, uh, which we can't say for all of these. So the Dell one looks similar to this, except extended out a little further. 
Uh, I'm not sure if Cooler Master manufactures this heatsink as well. It could be another supplier, but uh, assuredly, it's not expensive. Okay, video card and PCB. So what do we have? Well, we have uh, the, the fan connector up here next to a six pin. We have four memory modules on the right side and then two on the bottom, which is expected for cooling. Since there's no contact with the memory modules, what we're relying on entirely is airflow. And unfortunately, the airflow is going to be largely obstructed in a few key regions. One of those is right down in this area. There's a larger piece of aluminum. So this part where the, the mount is, there's a large blockage of airflow. So you're not gonna get a, a lot of airflow down in this quadrant. And additionally, another key mistake made by Dell that's actually made by a lot of board partners as well, so this isn't unique to Dell, is they're blocking their own <laughs> exhaust. So you look at the fins, the way the air moves is going to follow the fins. It can't go through them. It's, it's, it's not ethereal. <laughs> so the air is going to try and come out through the top here, through the side, side, and through the bottom. And out the side over here makes sense. It, it actually can exit. They did do a good job of getting an I.O. plate that has holes in it. That's sadly rarer than you would think. But at the top is 100% obstructed by this plastic shroud. NVIDIA does mandate that the board partners, or OEMs here, put GeForce GTX or RTX on the video card somewhere. But this could have been done in a way that doesn't actually completely obstruct the exhaust. There is nowhere for this air to go. It's going to come down and it'll try to go up and it's going to hit this and bounce off and then go wherever the turbulence allows it at that point. Same for this, we're blocking about half of the exhaust down here. We have a little bit of exhaust room here, but then that is going to immediately shoot into the motherboard near the PCIe slot, so it doesn't really have anywhere to go. That leaves the sides for the exhaust. So just poor design overall for even this cooler. The, even this could have been done better without increasing the materials used. Uh, board itself. So the PCB, we have a major red flag for me right away, which we have a V379 version 6.0. The amount of times we've seen anything over 1.0 is very low, and typically it stops at 1.1 or 1.2. To get to version 6 tells me there's a problem, and it's either with the design or they are using components that are so down-costed and bottom of the barrel that uh, the version changes regularly because they can't keep a steady supply of components. That's what that number tells me. That means that this device, I'm, I'm a little shaky to, to even assume that all these parts will be on, on yours if you were to buy one as well. You can see there's a lot of blanks, so there could have been other stuff on this board, maybe for a higher-end model, like a, well, uh, maybe a 2060 or something, but there's blanks for caps here blanks for inductors or chokes here. We've got two, three blanks for MOSFETs. The memory can't be filled. That's an NVIDIA thing, so that's fine. And then for components, we, we tried pretty hard to find these capacitors. There's a lot of stuff similar to them, but we couldn't find the exact capacitor for it. We couldn't find a data sheet for it online. Uh, so this is definitely something cheap. We're just, we weren't able to source the exact capacitor data sheet, which means we couldn't get a hard spec on the rating for it in terms of the uh, hours at a given temperature. For the, the MOSFETs, we've got two up here. These two, uh, from the, what the data sheet looks like, can do about 70 amps at 100 C. And then the FETs down here, let me read the actual numbers. So for these, it's a 5018SG. And uh, for the NCP option, they are 50 amp high side and low side combined MOSFETs. And uh, we think that the average recommended current from what we could find in the data sheet is 50 amps. Not great, pretty weak board design overall, but it's the thermals that, that concern us the most with the memory since there's zero contact here. As for the controller, it's an on semi NCP 81276. And let's take a look at the the fan as well. So again, I'm going to do screw tracking here on our mod mat and these grids. If you need a similar surface, you can check it out on the store. Just 
just helps me keep the screws separated so I know which types go where later. All right, there's the shroud. So this was made in January of 2021, actually. It is fairly recent. And the fan. Oh, PowerLogic. We've interviewed them. Or, yeah, there's a video on our channel somewhere. PowerLogic is a really common supplier. They work with EVGA. I think they've worked with Asus in the past. They, they make fans and things of that nature. So this is a 12 volt, half amp fan, 0.55 amps. Uh, if you needed to replace it at some point, there's the model number. You might need that if you have one of these cards because this doesn't look particularly powerful. And this is a double ball bearing fan. Okay, so that's it for the teardown. This gives you a good idea of what we're testing today. Uh, it is still a 1660 Super. So at the end of the day, the GPU is made by NVIDIA. So that's guaranteed to be a certain part. And in this case, it's a TU-116, so it's Turing-116 300A1. That's expected. And then the memory is Micron here. Uh, so these parts, the most important parts, are from someone else. And they are highly controlled. And there's really not other versions of them, like you have other versions of CAPS or MOSFETs or whatever. So this is what we care about for performance in gaming. But then we need to look at thermal performance, which will give us a better idea for longevity and just overall build quality. So let's get into the benchmark numbers of this. Thermally, it's about where you'd expect. The GPU core and thermals are actually technically fine. And the fan sticks to about 1830 RPM, which isn't too loud for what it is. But this highlights a problem in the unsophisticated designs like Dell's. Because the GPU isn't thermally out of control, the fan doesn't need to spin that fast. The result of this is that we end up with memory and other component thermals that suffer. With this cooler, the memory is entirely dependent on airflow. If there's no airflow from the case, like in the instance of the Dell G5 chassis, where it's really just an exhaust fan, and there's no airflow from the cooler, because the GPU is fine, so the fan's not spinning fast, then the memory would rely on direct contact with the heatsink to passively pull the heat away. Dell doesn't have that either. The memory just sits there. There's no contact with anything except for the PCB. The end result is bad. GPU thermals, again, are okay, while the forlorn VRM FETs run at about 80 degrees Celsius, and the memory modules run anywhere from 86 to 109 degrees Celsius. The spec on GDDR6 is somewhat variable, as NVIDIA can get special sign-offs from memory vendors, or whomever else might supply the memory, aside from Samsung and Micron. And so, for the most part, it's regarded as a 105 to 110 degrees Celsius range, with 110C, generally being the highest listing you'll find in a memory TJ Maxx spec. Dell is about at that limit. This card might not fare well if we stress test it long term and on and off gaming scenarios, but it's a game of numbers at that point where you're rolling the dice and ultimately the design is simply bad. Our next test looks at the mounting pressure and the contact patch of the cheap stock cooler that Dell is using. Working with chemically reactive paper and over $9,000 of testing equipment made affordable by those of you buying mouse pads and PC building mod mats from store.gamersnexus.net and from Patreon backers, thank you, we were able to produce this image. In the pseudo color pressure map, you can see a clear line on the left side, but a rapid fade on the right side and near the center of the GPU. Overlaying the pressure map on top of an actual photo of the GPU helps to reveal the situation. Dell's cooler is properly contacting around 60% of the GPU, leaving the rest with low pressure. There's still contact via thermal paste, it's just not much. This is more of a matter of the mounting pressure and the mounting hardware than it is the heatsink flatness. Dell doesn't have enough pressure here, and part of that is because they don't have enough mounting hardware or hardware that applies enough pressure. The end result is a loose cooler, just like the loose CPU cooler on the G5 CPU. It can wiggle around under force, and it leaves much to be desired. This level of die contact is only possible if someone's working very hard to specifically not try. The thing is that the surface is actually relatively consistent overall in flatness, which may be easier when you only have aluminum to work with. Our surface depth testing needle indicates a median of about 20 microns of depth from a known zero point, with the other core tiles establishing a range of about 10 to 35 microns. Dell is overall consistent here, and they're not doing too poorly. There's certainly worse ones on the market in terms of flatness, 
It's just unfortunate that the rest of the cooler is so bad because the flatness here is pretty good for something so cheap. Gaming performance on the Dell G5 5000 GPU is expected to be standard as the GPU itself is made by Nvidia. So there's not much room for Dell to screw it up. It's the longevity or the endurance of the board and the cooling efficacy that Dell has the most control over. And as a reminder, these tests are of the GPU not of the Dell G5 5000 as a system. We already have those in the review of that system. In some quick validation gaming tests with a standardized test platform, so it's pulled out of the Dell computer and placed in our normal GPU test bench, we end up with gaming numbers largely the same as an MSI Ventus GTX 1660 Super as a control. And this shift in our cyber power system, the review for which should already be live by now. In Tomb Raider, we measured the Dell GPU at around 88 FPS average, the same as the MSI card. Lows are also within run-to-run -run variants here. Strange Brigade showed the same thing. Dell's GPU in a standard platform with access to air ran around 118 FPS average with lows at 94 and 60. That's again about the same as the Ventus and we're within error and run-to-run -run variation. Red Dead 2 showed the same. We are at about 66 FPS average between both when using our standardized platform. Between these two GPUs, it looks like it's doing fine. We have other games we tested as well, but they're all the same. There's no real reason to keep reproving that the G5's GPU gaming performance is relatively unchanging against a normal GPU on a standard AIB partners board. So that's the benchmarks and the review of the video card itself that was included in the G5 5000. It's, it's cheap, and that's really what's so disappointing is just this is clearly a, a minimum effort product in its entirety. The entire, the most effort that went into the Dell G5 5000 was in selling you a warranty and in engineering the parts that they're proprietary so they can't ever be used in any other application that makes sense, basically. That's how we see it. And this video card's no exception where this is just about, in, in the literal sense, the cheapest possible way to make a 1660 Super. You can't go any cheaper than what Dell's done here uh, without stuff instantly failing, as opposed to just either being bad or failing long term. So this is it. This is the, if you've wondered what the bottom of the barrel looks like, you know, the barrel's got a lot of stuff in, in it, and you've always thought, huh, I wonder what's under all of the good stuff in this barrel and what the bottom looks like. It's this. This is what the bottom looks like. There is no lower. You, you would have to get an excavator to go lower than what Dell has made here. So, uh, unfortunately, it's the cheapest possible cooler. There's literally zero copper anywhere in this. The only, actually, that's not 100% true. There's a little bit of copper that's going to be in the windings uh, for the fan here. So the copper windings that, that go around the electromagnet, there's your copper, but there's none in the heat sink itself. And unfortunately, no contact. There's zero thermal pads, which is another kind of insane thing. Uh, it's fine to not have a back plate. Actually, this card doesn't either. But to, to just not even attempt to cool the memory, it's, it's not good. So very disappointing to see how little Dell cares about making a product that has any value whatsoever uh, other than getting it out the door to maybe an unsuspecting or uninformed consumer. So really not happy with this one, the, the entire assembly. You know, we were hoping that the video card would be the one thing that would make sense in that computer because of the shortage. And even then, you'd be better off buying a different system from a different OEM or SI to try and get something that someone has at least put a couple more dollars into, literally. Like an extra $4 would have made a world of difference in this thing. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to support us directly while getting something in return, like our mouse pads, where we have the black and red and the blue and black options on the store now. Or you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like some behind-the-scenes videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.